Is a car really a car, or is it just a four-wheeled existential crisis waiting to happen? That's right, folks, we're going deep today. Deeper than the odometer on a second-hand sedan. Consider this. When you look at your car, do you see a vehicle, or do you see a profound philosophical paradox on wheels? Is it just a hunk of metal that gets you from point A to point B, or is it a metaphor for life's journey, full of twists, turns, unexpected bumps, and the occasional need for a tune-up? Is it not a testament to the human condition reflecting our unending quest for progress even as we guzzle down resources and pollute our environment? Or is it simply a means to an end, a practical solution to a practical problem? So is your car really a car or is it just a metal beast on a journey to nowhere? Did you know the first cars didn't even have steering wheels? They used levers. Imagine driving to work like you're operating a crane. Oh, the early days of cars, they were a hoot. Picture this, you're cruising down the street, your horseless carriage chugging along at a blistering pace. And by blistering, I mean slower than your grandma's Sunday stroll. We're talking less than 10 miles per hour, people. That's right, the first cars were slower than a jogger on a treadmill. And steering? That was a whole different ball game. No spinning wheels, no power steering, nope. Cars were steered with levers, like some kind of steam-powered contraption straight out of a Jules Verne novel. You had to wrestle with these levers to make even the slightest turn. And if you thought parallel parking is hard now, well, let's just say it was a full body workout back then. But the quirks don't stop there. The materials used to build these early automobiles would make even the most frugal of us raise an eyebrow. Wood, leather, even paper mache. Yes, you heard that right, paper mache. I guess it's one way to recycle your old newspapers. And the noise. These cars didn't purr, they roared, or maybe coughed is a better term. The sound of the engine was enough to scare off any wildlife within a five-mile radius. Not exactly the stealthy getaway vehicle for a bank heist. And let's not forget the fact that these vehicles were hand-cranked. Yes, before you could even set off on your journey, you had to manually start the engine. Talk about a pre-workout routine. It's funny to think how far we've come since those early days of automotive innovation. From levers and paper mache to self-driving electric cars, the journey has been, well, quite a ride. So next time you complain about traffic, just remember, you could be driving a car with a lever. Ever feel like you're not going anywhere fast? Well, you're in good company. The first car's top speed was a whopping two and a half miles per hour. That's slower than a horse and buggy. Now let's take a moment to appreciate the irony of this. We're talking about a machine that was invented to make our lives easier, to get us from point A to point B faster, and it was outperformed by a horse, a horse, people, but it gets even better. Or should I say slower? Because you see, two and a half miles per hour isn't just slower than a horse, it's slower than a lot of things. Like for example, a garden snail. Yes, you heard it right, a garden snail. A creature known for its distinct lack of speed, a creature that's become a universal symbol for slowness. The average garden snail, bless its little slimy heart, moves at a speed of approximately one mile per hour. So you could say that the first car was a bit of a speedy snail, but only just. Imagine that for a second. Picture yourself sitting in your brand new car, feeling all proud and excited. And then out of the corner of your eye, you see a snail, a tiny slimy snail inching its way past you. And you're sitting there in your car, watching it pull ahead. And you can't do anything about it because your car, your brand spanking new car, is slower than a snail. And it's not just snails either. The first cars were slower than a lot of things, slower than turtles, slower than sloths, slower than a dog on a lazy Sunday afternoon stroll. So next time you're stuck in a traffic jam, just remember, at least you're not driving at a snail's pace. You think your car drinks a lot of gas? The first cars were such gas guzzlers, they probably could have run on your morning coffee. Now, let's take a trip down memory lane, back to the good old days when cars were just learning to crawl. They were like newborn babies, gulping down gallons of fuel with the innocence of a kitten chasing a laser pointer. Imagine if your car was like your friend who never seems to get full, no matter how much they eat. Early cars were just like that, but instead of food, their diet consisted of good old gasoline. They were the automotive equivalent of your cousin Jerry at Thanksgiving, scarfing down everything in sight and still asking, is there more? And talking about diets, these cars had an appetite that would put a competitive eater to shame. They could drink a whole swimming pool of gas and still ask for seconds. I mean, they were practically on a seafood diet. 
except replace the seafood with gasoline. They saw fuel, they consumed it. They were so thirsty they could have given a run for their money to the Sahara Desert. They consumed so much gas you'd think they were trying to solve the energy crisis by themselves. And the fuel efficiency? Let's just say if they were a student, they'd be the ones sitting in the corner with a dunce cap. Now don't get me wrong, these cars weren't evil, they were just misunderstood. They were like the cookie monster of the automotive world. All they wanted was more gas. More gas. Nom. 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 And let's not forget how they performed. They were like a sloth on a sugar rush. All that energy, but not much to show for it. If they were a band, they'd be one-hit wonders, consuming all that fuel for a single, not-so-impressive performance. So the next time you're filling your tank, be grateful your car isn't a caffeine addict. Ever thought your car was a lemon? Well, some of the first luxury cars were literally made of silk and gold. Talk about a fancy lemon. Now let's take a moment to appreciate the absurdity of the automobile world. You see, once upon a time, some folks thought it would be a splendid idea to craft luxury cars from materials that had no business being in a car. And no, we're not talking about the plush leather seats or the mahogany dashboards. We're talking about the real head scratchers here. Picture this. The year is 1900 and change. You're a wealthy tycoon with money burning a hole in your pocket. What better way to spend it than on a car made entirely of silk? Yes, you heard that right, silk. The stuff your grandmother's fancy handkerchiefs are made of. Now it might look pretty stylish, but let's just say that it's not the most practical choice for a vehicle. I mean, imagine getting caught in the rain in that thing, but hold on, we're not done yet. Let's crank up the extravagance a notch. How about gold? Yes, there were actually cars that were decked out in gold. Not just gold-plated, mind you, but solid gold. Because why not, right? Now, you might be thinking, surely that's as extravagant as it gets. Well, my friend, you would be wrong. Let's not forget about the car that was studded with a thousand diamonds, because nothing says luxury like blinding oncoming traffic with your sparkly ride. The point is, there's a fine line between luxury and absurdity. And these cars, they didn't just cross that line, they sped over it in a gold-plated, silk-lined, diamond-studded chariot. So your car might not be made of gold, but at least it's not a shiny, expensive lemon. Tired of terrestrial traffic? Don't worry, flying cars are coming. Well, as soon as we figure out how to stop them from crashing into each other. Now imagine your morning commute. You're stuck in traffic, sipping lukewarm coffee and wondering why the guy in the car next to you has a pet llama. Suddenly you hit a button and whoosh, you're soaring above it all, leaving the llama guy in your dust. But hold your horses, or should I say, propellers? We're not quite there yet, we've got a few speed bumps to tackle. Like how do we prevent mid-air collisions? Maybe we need a giant floating roundabout. Or perhaps we should train birds to be traffic cops. Imagine a hawk with a whistle and a high-vis vest. And then there's the question of landing. If I can barely parallel park, how am I supposed to land on a rooftop? Do we need runways on every street? Or maybe we all need to take a crash course in parachuting. Now, let's not forget about the underwater cars. Yes, you heard right, underwater cars. Sure, they're a great idea until you remember that you can't roll down your windows to ask for directions. And let's not even start on the issue of seagulls. And of course, there are the self-driving cars. Sounds great, right? Until your car decides it wants to go to the car wash and you're trying to get to a job interview. Or even worse, when it develops a crush on the cute convertible next door and keeps taking you on detours past its driveway. So, as you can see, the future of cars is both hilarious and challenging. But hey, at least it's not boring. We've got flying, diving, and sentient cars to look forward to. Who knows, maybe one day we'll even have teleporting cars. Now, wouldn't that be something? So, keep your eyes on the skies because the future of cars is looking up. So, is a car really a car, or is it a snail-paced, gas-guzzling, gold-plated flying machine of the future? Let's take a moment to reflect on our journey. We started with a philosophical quandary that would stump even Socrates. Is a car a car? It's a question that has us all revved up, and we've been pedal to the metal ever since. We delved into the birth of cars, and it was more than just a mechanical labor. It was a momentous event, with the first car coming into the world kicking and screaming, or rather, revving and honking. We then looked at the slow pokes of the car world, the speedy snails. 
Let's face it, they aren't winning any races. But hey, slow and steady might not win the race, but it does make for a smoother ride. Next, we jumped into the gas guzzlers, those vehicular vampires that drain your wallet faster than a teenager on a shopping spree. But don't despair, they provide the much-needed adrenaline rush that your morning coffee fails to deliver. We then luxuriated in the lap of the luxurious lemons. They may be bitter to the pocket, but they sure are sweet to the eyes and the ego. And finally, we soared into the future with the future flyers. It's still a pipe dream for most of us, but hey, we can dream, can't we? So, circling back to our initial question, is a car really a car? Or is it just a mechanical snail with a thirst for gas, a penchant for luxury, and dreams of flight? Well, we'll leave that up to you to decide. After all, a car can be whatever you want it to be. It can be your sanctuary, your partner in crime, your ticket to freedom, or just a really expensive piece of metal. And if you want to hear more about the existential crises of everyday objects, subscribe to our channel. We promise, it's more fun than a car with a lever.